uh, arsenide and uh, chromium over uh, iron and manganese oxide. We have Professor Daniel Strong from uh, Temple University is with us, the eminent person. Along with uh, Daniel Strong, we have two experts, Professor K. Palnivelu from Anna University, Chennai, and uh, Dr. Uh, Chayandas from uh, uh, VNIT, Nagpur. So before starting the program, I just introduce Dr. Daniel Strong. Daniel, Professor Daniel Strong holds doctorate degree in chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley, and postdoctorate from IBM Amdain Research Center, USA. Currently, he is the chair and professor of Temple University, Philadelphia. He is the recipient of no, numerous honors and awards, including National Science Foundation Young Investigator Award in NYI University, Merit Award for Teaching and Cur Curriculum Development at Sony Stony Book, etc., etc., etc. To his credit, he has more than 130 publications and a few patents. His research includes surface science, environmental chemistry, nanoscience chemistry, surface chemistry of geochemical, material, uh, geochemical materials, catalysts for energy applications, etc. So uh, now we can go for, we can listen the words of Dr. Daniel Ashrangin. Professor, please. Great, thank you. thank you for the kind introduction. Let me just, um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Yeah. And I assume you can see my title slide now. Yeah, it is fine now. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move my camera so that it's you can actually see me while I'm looking at my... Okay, great. Well, it's, yeah. it's a pleasure to be invited. It's a pleasure to be invited to give this talk. And what I wanna do is kind of give you an overview of some work that's been done in our group and, and in other groups, looking at the photochemistry of ars arsenite and chromate on iron oxides and manganese oxides, and also show you some interesting reactions that can happen in the dark or the, of course, the absence of light that really kind of um, defines the special um, characteristics of small band gap semiconductors, such as iron oxides and manganese oxides. So we're gonna um, look at this uh, chromium six or chromate and let me just see if I can get a pointer here so I can. Um, uh, let's see here, laser pointer, there we go. Um, and what we're gonna do is look at the, I'm gonna show you some reactions looking at the reduction of chromate to chromium three and also the oxidation of arsenite to arsenate on iron oxides, also manganese, manganese oxide. So I'll try to show you some basic principles. Before I get started, let me just um, kind of share with you the key, key contributors to this research. This is actually an old, uh, an old group photo. Uh, the uh, group's slightly smaller by about two people, but uh, what I wanna do is really point out three people, Elizabeth Serkaz, uh, who did a lot of the work on actually the um, reaction of chromate and arsenite on small band gap semiconductors, Sam Shumless, who did a lot of the work on arsenite chemistry on manganese oxides, and Ryan Bondari, who did a lot of the work on arsenite on iron oxides. And some of the theoretical work or computational work has been largely in collaboration with James Kabicki, who's at the University of Texas at El Paso, and also a lot of collaboration with Richard Reeder over the years, uh, who's at uh, Stony Brook University. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna kind of skip this to save time. Everybody knows, uh, I, I think probably everybody knows chromate is uh, quite a toxic species, uh, carcinogen. Um, it would be nice if you could remove chromate from uh, certain uh, Superfund sites, for example, in the United States at least. And, and typically that chemistry involves the reduction of chromium six plus to chromium three plus, which is much more uh, benign. Um, and, and arsenite, and I'm going to, um, I think there's a lot of work that you've done on, on arsenic chemistry and in both its primary oxidation states, arsenic three plus and arsenic five plus, it, it's toxic to uh, biological systems. So let me just show this as, as kind of a, you know, a very uh, kind of general review. Um, so what, the two reactions that I'll kind of be talking about on these small band gap semiconductors 
is chromate and the reduction of chromate or chromium six plus to chromium three plus. That's going to, going to be one important reaction that we look at. And, and also the oxidation of arsenic three plus uh, to arsenic five plus. So those are kind of the key reactions that we'll be looking at uh, in, this, in this talk. Um, again, you know, the two important oxidation states are uh, chromium six plus and chromium three plus and arsenic five plus and arsenic uh, three plus. Okay, let me just skip over that. Um, so what I wanna do first is talk about the photochemistry of arsenite on iron oxy oxides, actually iron oxyhydroxides. And the, the materials I'll be looking at, I'll show you this in a coming slide, is uh, two phases of iron oxyhydroxide, one being ferrihydrite, which is a, kind of an intrinsically nano dimension material, typically coming in, you know, typically no larger than eight or nine nanometers uh, diameter. And then what we're gonna look at is compare that to uh, gertite, which is one of the more prevalent iron oxyhydroxides uh, in nature. And I'm gonna kind of show you how when we kind of um, can, when these materials absorb light, they're small band gap semiconductors, they can absor absorb that energy uh, of the photon and do some interesting chemistry with both arsenite and, uh, and even chromate. Now there's been some work um, prior to when we got into this, you know, early work in the early 2000s, I should say, uh, looking at the photochemical uh, reaction of arsenite uh, or the conversion of arsenite uh, to arsenate. And I'm kind of just showing you, you know, what, you know, the, the chemistry or, or it has been known that you can convert uh, arsenite to arsenate um, on iron bearing materials uh, in the presence of, of light. Okay, and then in the dark, however, there's very little redox chemistry. So you, you can absorb arsenite and arsenate on iron oxyhydroxides. You'll get absorption, for example, these, these species um, absorb to the iron oxyhydroxide surface, but don't necessarily undergo redox chemistry. Uh, when we shine light, however, uh, you can induce redox chemistry and change the oxidation states uh, of the arsenic. So that's really gonna be important. In, in the work that um, I kind of review. Now, let me just say at the beginning, these are really two key take home messages. And we're gonna be looking at small band gap semiconductors. So these are semiconductors with band gaps at uh, you know, maybe three electron volts or smaller. Okay, so they can absorb uh, visible light and ultraviolet light. And you can get excitation of an electron from the valence band to the conduction band uh, producing an oxidative hole in the valence band and a reducing electron in the conduction band. And you can drive a lot of interesting chemistry uh, by doing that. Also, a second take home point is, now this is in the dark. So this, this is really, you know, you need light excitation to drive this kind of chemistry uh, in the dark. However, what we found in our lab is that the small band gap semiconductor can actually act as a wire essentially connecting electrically the donor, a donor molecule ready to give up an electron to, the, to an acceptor molecule, uh, one ready to accept an electron. And essentially the surface provides a pathway by which this electron can flow from the donor to the acceptor. The case we'll be looking at, the donor will be arsenite or arsenic three plus, and the acceptor will be chromium six plus. If you do this in a homogeneous solution, not much happens, but if you absorb these materials on a small band gap of semiconductor, you can actually uh, drive the redox chemistry or the electron transfer reaction. So, so these are really uh, two key points that I want to uh, kind of uh, keep coming back to in this talk. And this is just to show what, what, I'm, what I've mentioned. This is the photo excitation of the band gap. So you have a valence band here, a conduction band, uh, you can absorb a photon. There is an electron promotion to the conduction band, leaving an oxidative hole. This can oxidize a, uh, for example, a donor to uh, oxidize donor and reduce an acceptor to a, to a, um, a reduced uh, acceptor. So one can think of this, for example, you know, the arsenite chemistry, a lot of that's gonna be due to 
oxidation of arsenite to arsenate uh, through this oxidative hole, and then the reduction of chromate to uh, chromium three plus uh, through. Now, I'm gonna show you this occurring separately on surfaces and then together uh, in the dark. And it, that brings me to this, in the, in the dark, what you can also have is that the donor molecule, for example, can donate an electron to the conduction band. So this is without light. So you can donate an electron to the conduction band and then that electron can find its way into the uh, acceptor, okay? So this is with light, this is without light. Uh, that you can drive redox chemistry on these um, on these small band gap semiconductors. Okay, and the two materials I'm going to use we've we've looked at a lot of other phases of iron oxide. We've had a long-standing kind of interest in ferry hydride. There's actually a science article looking at the structure of this material, and it's a, it's an intrinsically nano dimension material. So. Um, how you make this material is actually, if you could just put ferric chloride in solution at low pH, it's soluble, and then you raise the pH, for example, and what you see is a precipitate, and, and a lot of that is this uh, ferry hydride phase. And it's, you know, look at it with a transmission electron microscopy, very small particles. So these are, you know, typically uh, less than 10 nanometers uh, diameter. Very, um, a lot of surface area. Uh, so you can pack a lot of surface area into little mass. Very interesting material. Um, it's not really known why, why it's intrinsically um, a nano dimension material, but you don't see growth beyond uh, that small dimension. It, however, is a really, you know, kind of a metastable phase in that it can con convert to more stable iron oxide, oxyhydroxide phases, uh, such as gertite, which I'm gonna talk about next, and also to iron oxide, such as hematite, just by heating this material or, or applying external uh, stresses to the system. So this is a ferry hydrate, one of the materials we'll be looking at. Again, it's a small band gap semiconductor with a band gap of roughly 2.5 electron volts. A gertite, a much more common material in nature, uh, you, you see it in these uh, kind of needle structures. Uh, it's, it's double chains of, of, of octahedrally coordinated um, iron, uh, a very, very interesting structure, really not the point of this talk, uh, but we're going to kind of compare these two phases. And even though they're both iron oxyhydroxide phases, I'll kind of show you some subtle differences between the surface chemistry that, that actually um, changes the uh, redox chemistry. Okay, so just real quick, so electronic structure of iron oxyhydroxides, again, I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but you've got a, basically this is kind of uh, the electronic structure. Again, really all we wanna know is that we're gonna be exciting uh, electrons when, we when these materials absorb light. We're gonna take an electron from the valence band, we're gonna populate the conduction band. In, in iron oxyhydroxides, typically when that electron goes into the conduction band, there's a transient reduction of iron three plus, which is the intrinsic redox state of iron in these ferric oxides uh, to iron two plus. And you know, that's gonna be a key photochemical reaction. Of course, when you do this to make this chemistry happen, that oxidative hole has to be consumed. There has to be a whole scavenger to allow this chemistry to happen. And I'll kind of explain what we do there um, to uh, complete the circuit essentially. Okay, and, and this, you know, I just mentioned this ferric, you know, when you photo excite iron oxyhydroxides, uh, initially you have iron three plus in that material and it's, and it's, tr it's reduced to iron two plus. And iron two plus is actually soluble under a lot of uh, solution conditions. And this is, you know, what I show here is, is kind of a, an old paper, uh, very, very tremendous paper, um, which, which kind of talks at the, about the environmental uh, impact of this type of reduction step. So, so in nature, of course, you have all kinds of potential whole scavengers, oxalic acid, for example, uh, in the environment can act as a whole scavenger. And when you get this photo excitation, what you can do is you can basically, um, you can absorb light. Uh, you first start with an iron three plus, you can absorb light and form iron two, and this iron two is soluble and it solubilizes into solution. So it leaves the crystal lattice as iron two. 
And in nature, this, this happens, and then it can be reoxidized, for example, with dissolved O2. Actually, in nature, uh, you typically see during, during daylight, the uh, ferrous reaction. Uh, you see more ferrous relative to, to nighttime, where this in daytime, these iron oxides are absorbing light. They're forming iron two. This is, of course, some reoxidation of this iron two, but you're generating iron two. And night, there's no photochemistry. This iron two is all been converted back to uh, iron three. And you kind of see this uh, change uh, in the uh, in natural systems. But we're going to utilize this to do uh, kind of some interesting uh, environmental chemistry. A lot of our work over the years has been you know, looking at um, these iron oxides, shining light on them, understanding the chemistry of arsenite and chromate. Uh, we typically use um, uh, Fourier transform infrared for a lot of our experiments. We use a um, kind of a, you know, the attenuated total reflection experiment. So this kind of gives us surface sensitivity. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail, but, but a lot of this, you know, you can basically take this attenuated total reflection lens that you can put in your infrared system. You can coat that lens with these particles of iron oxide and you can flow, for example, different species across the iron oxide. Uh, you can shine light in there with a fiber optic and you can look at the chemistry. Uh, so we're interested, of course, in the bulk chemistry. We're also interested in, you know, what 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 happens on the surface to produce this different types of chemistry. I, I mentioned before, we're going to be looking at uh, ferrihydrite and gertite and compare those two. They're both iron oxyhydroxides, but they behave slightly differently with regard to uh, iron three oxidation. Okay, so this is kind of a kind of sets the stage of what, you, um, what you'll be seeing in a lot of these data slides. So this is absorbance in the infrared experiment. This is just wave numbers here. And this is just basically a stack of plots. So this bottom plot here is just arsenite prior to shining light. So what we're doing here is putting these iron oxide particles in the infrared spectrometer. And what we do is we flow arsenite across, but with no, with no light. Um, so you see a absorption band here at 770 that's due to an arsenic oxygen stretch of the arsenite species. We know we have arsenite there. And then what we do, this time is really time of exposure to light. So we basically start shining light. And then what happens is you, you'll see this arsenite contribution. I haven't um, kind of fit these, you know, we, we've of course fitted these over time, but this is just the raw data. Uh, you, you'll see this arsenite. Um, a peak uh, remain, there's still constant absorption, but then you'll see a, a peak start increasing here. Now this is with light. If you don't have light, nothing happens. You'll just basically sit here. Uh, but with light, you see the growth of this uh, peak at 805 and 876. This is due to arsenate. So what you're doing is ad absorbing or, or actually um, oxidizing arsenite to arsenate. Now this, this experiment is surface sensitive. So we do not, or we cannot see aqueous species. So for example, this arsenate, we know from the experiment that this is absorbed to the surface. We're not looking at, it could be in the solution, but we won't see it in this experiment. We're only seeing the arsenate that absorbed onto the surface. Uh, so you see this replacement of arsenite with arsenate. And then this is for ferrihydrite. This is that small nano crystalline material. What's interesting about this is, you know, you build up arsenate and then the reaction primarily just stops because what happens is you form arsenate. It's strongly bound to the iron oxide uh, surface and it essentially uh, blocks further absorption of arsenite. And that's kind of shown here. This is a um, critical slide, but this is just the total ars arsenic absorbed on a ferrihydrite material uh, versus time. This red curve here, or this red plot, is just arsenite, no light, in the dark. So this is just the total arsenite that you can absorb onto this ferrihydrite under dark conditions. Okay, so over time, it doesn't change. It just saturates on the surface and, and doesn't stop. This is another control experiment, this blue one. This is arsenate 
arsenic five plux. So again, we just put in arsen arsenic five, no light. And you can, you can absorb more arsenate than ars arsenite on these surfaces. And you can kind of explain this by uh, electrostatic arguments. Um, the arsenite being largely a, um, a neutral uh, species in solution. Much you need deprotonation and adsorption. That's uh, something, that's a topic for perhaps another talk. Um, this is if you turn on the light, so the green one. So if you didn't turn on the light, the arsenite would just remain here. But when you turn on the light, what happens is you get this increase. And this is the, um, the amount of, uh, um, in, in the presence of light, where you see the adsorption. And this should actually be, this is arsenate product, but you're flowing arsenite across the surface. And you get arsenate, and you actually, the arsenate concentration is, is somewhat uh, higher than the uh, control experiment. We think we know that. That's really due to a lot of uh, dissolution, reprecipitation reactions, where you get changes in the structure of the ferry hydrate. But most of this arsenate or arsenate product is, is really absorbing onto the um, uh, absorbing onto the uh, ferry hydride surface. And you can go to the, you know, we've done a lot of uh, synchrotron work where you can do um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy and confirm that arsenite or arsenic-3 has really converted to arsenate. And this is really just showing some uh, X-ray data just showing before and after where you can convert the arsenite. This is a control arsenite on the surface. This green one is with light arsenite, but then exposed to light, and you form uh, arsenate. And the blue one is just basically control experiment showing you that this peak. So this is the photon energy at the synchrotron. Uh, perhaps you've done these types of experiments where you can increase the photon energy. There's an absorption um, of the, um, of the um, electrons in the core levels to unoccupied uh, levels, and you can uh, distinguish oxidation states. But very similar to what we, the conclusion we come to uh, from the infrared spectroscopy. Okay, so what's happening in this case, what we think is happening at least, actually, you know, this, this chemistry um, is, is quite complicated, but we think the, the general idea is that you get this oxidative hole, you can oxidize, you can oxidize arsenic three to arsenate, and then you can get the reduction of iron three to iron two. This actually leaves the surface. We can see iron two going into the uh, solution. Now, what I've left out here is we don't think there's much uh, reactive oxygen uh, species chemistry in solution that, that results from this type of chemistry. And I'm gonna kind of show you in ferry hydride, we don't think that's happening. On gertite, we think that's happening. And I'm gonna sh show you the, uh, the surface chemistry that allows it to happen in one case and not the other. So what I think is happening in this case is the arsenite is being largely or primarily oxidized on the iron oxy oxyhydroxide surface to arsenate and then it just sticks. And in the GERD type case, what I'm gonna show you is I think a lot of the oxidation of the arsenic three occurs in solution in addition to the surface. Um, so in this case, what we think is happening is this arsenite, we shine light on it, um, it gets converted to arsenic-5, and we, we see no iron-2 uh, going into solution, uh, or, or it's not, not observed in this case. Um, and then we see this uh, arsenite, um, actually in this case, I, I apologize, this is, I converted it from another slide. This, this should be uh, iron-2 does go into solution, um, for the um, for the ferry hydride case, that's going to be a key a, a key step. I'll kind of show you that in a moment. Um, so this is the aqueous oxidation uh, iron two production in the presence of light. So so here I just showed you arsenite on the surface being oxidized to arsenate. Uh, in doing as that arsenite is being oxidized to arsenate, there's iron two or ferrous that goes into solution. And this is just showing, you know, over time as arsenite is being oxidized to arsenate, there's a uh, increase in the iron two. Uh, but there's no aqueous, uh, actually arsenic three uh, product and oxidation just occurs on the surface. It all gets oxidized on the surface to arsenate. And that's, that's and you see iron two uh, going into the uh, solution. 
And if you and if there's oxygen present, of course, this this iron too will be oxidized to uh, iron oxyhydroxides. Uh, if there's no oxygen around and oxic conditions, uh, that iron too will survive uh, for quite a while. Okay, so this is what I'm doing here, and I'm going to show you the difference in the chemistry. So what I want to do is very hydride again. What I've tried to show you is that we could shine light on this material. It oxidizes arsenite to arsenate. Uh, and then in doing so, iron two goes into solution, but we think most of the iron three oxidation occurs uh, on the surface. And if we compare, so this is gertite, all of them, all of a sudden I'm showing in, um, shoving gertite into a slide. I'm gonna show you some chemistry on there, but, but this is the iron two to, to arsenic five ratio. So this is the product that you form by oxidizing iron three. And this is also product, right? This is the reduction product of iron three to iron two that goes into solution. And under anoxic conditions, so there's no oxygen in solution. So the iron two that comes off the surface remains as iron two. We can determine the amount of iron two. We can compare it to the amount of arsenic five that we um, see on the surface. And you get approximately a two to one ratio of, of iron two to iron five, which kind of agrees with the uh, stoichiometry. In the uh, Gertite case, however, you see um, much less uh, iron two uh, coming off the surface into, uh, into solution. And, and that's gonna be important in, in explaining the different types of chemistry uh, for arsenite oxidation on very hydrite and Gertite. So this is the rate of arsenic five production. And, and notice that the Gertite rate is, is higher uh, by almost, well, you know, an order of magnitude uh, than the ferry hydride. So gertite is a much more efficient uh, agent to oxidize arsenite to arsenate, again, in the presence of light, if you don't have any light around. And I should add, in a lot of these experiments, as the whole scavenger, we use tartrate, right? Because when we get this photo, um, well, in the, okay, wait, yeah, let me, let me save that for later. But in this case, the, um, in these cases, the, the whole scavenger, of course, is the arsenite being uh, oxidized to arsenate. Okay, and this is the uh, gertite, much higher. What I wanna do now is show you why is the, why is the uh, oxidation rate of arsenite to arsenate higher on, on gertite, okay? And this kind of gets into the subtleties of the surface chemistry of different oxyhydroxides. Okay, so in the uh, gertite is a little different where you can get um, the oxidation of arsenic three to arsenic five. Uh, in doing so, you get iron two. But what I'm gonna show you is in the, in the gertite case, a lot of this iron two, or at least the kinetics of iron two release into solution. So on ferry hydrate that I showed you before, this iron two flops into solution. On the gertite case, its residence time re is, is high enough that it stays on the surface and it can catalytically or can oxi be oxidized to iron three very rapidly with um, dissolved O2. And that we think generates reactive oxygen species in solution that can go on to oxidize arsenic three to arsenic five. This accounts, or what I'm kind of suggesting is this accounts for the higher oxidation rates that we see on gertite relative to ferrihydrite, largely because of the difference in the, essentially the release kinetics of iron two into solution. Okay, so again, uh, arsenite oxidation is limited to ferrihydrite surface and the solution phase arsenate product dominates in the gertag case. Okay. And, and this is what I want to show you. So this is going to come down to, you know, wh why do we think iron two sticks on gertite better than on ferrihydrite, right? Because on gertite, when we photogenerate iron two, it stays on the surface and essentially it can be, in, in it can be very rapidly oxidized to iron three uh, forming superoxide and that superoxide can go on and do, do chemistry and solution, namely oxidizing arsenite to arsenate. And what I want to show is just the, you know, this is the, the point of zero charge. So uh, I suspect everybody's familiar with these types of concepts with um, the charging of oxide surfaces at very 
uh, low pH, for example, where you have a lot of protons around, uh, you can get a positively charged surface. As you raise the pH, for example, uh, you go through um, a pH where actually the charge in the surface is, is essentially zero. And then when you go to higher pH or higher hydroxide concentration in solution, you can form a negatively, um, a negatively charged uh, material. The charge on the uh, materials, of course, helps explain perhaps the adsorption of anions and cations. A negatively charged surface um, is going to attract cations in solution. A positively charged surface, for example, um, uh, attracting uh, anions on surface. And I was going to go over this just for sake of brevity. I just want to, you know, this is basically uh, taken from uh, fundamentals of mineralogy and geochemistry. But essentially, what we're showing here is the uh, charge on a surface. This is the zero charge here. So at very low pH, for example, you get a positively charged surface. As you increase the pH, there's a decrease in the charge. You go through this point of zero charge. And this is different for different iron oxides. Actually, it's different for ferry hydrate and gertite. That's the whole point, uh, as I'll show you. And then as you go to higher pH, of course, you go to into a negatively charged um, region where the surface is um, uh, deprotonated at, at the uh, higher pH. Okay, and this is just showing this could, just, this could be, you know, quite different on different surfaces, right? So the point of zero charge in aluminum oxide is up here at uh, 9.5, whereas on silicon dioxide, for example, the point of zero charge is down to uh, 1.5. Of course, you have to go to very low pH to um, uh, basically um, acquire that point of zero charge on the uh, silicon uh, dioxide. Okay. What I want to do is kind of use this simple argument to essentially uh, look at um, how the, um, the uh, gertite and ferrihydrite are uh, different, for example. So if you take a look at, if you just take iron two in solution. So in this experiment, all we've done is we've taken gertite and ferrihydrite, these two materials we've been looking at. And we put iron two into solution. And then we look at essentially the amount of iron two that sticks to the surface as a function of pH. And if you do this experiment, you find out that the amount of iron two absorbed on gertite, if you, if you look at this, and again, we're, we're doing our chemistry. I, I, I forgot to mention, but we're about 5.5 uh, our pH in most of our experiments. And as we increase the uh, pH, you see the amount of iron two absorbing increasing. So at the very, at the very low pH here, uh, you've got a positively charged surface. Uh, there's not much iron two plus adsorption on the surface. But then as you start to um, go to higher pHs, you start to see iron two being absorbed. Notice here that the, the amount of iron two that's basically being absorbed on, on gertite is you, you can see that it's basically increasing here at 5.5, uh, where it takes much higher pH to get the iron two to start absorbing onto the ferrihydrite. And this is due to the difference in the point of zero charge. I mean, if you look ferrihydrite, it's got a higher point of zero charge than the gertite. So the pHs we're looking at, the propensity of iron two to stick to the surface is, is higher on the gertite than the ferrihydrite. We think that essentially is the reason for the difference in chemistry of the, of the arsenite oxidation. Why we think that is, so what we think then is this iron two, so this is like an iron oxyhydroxide surface. We have iron two interacting with it. Uh, you can very, very char you can essentially get very charged, um, very rapid charge transfer in iron oxyhydroxides uh, to form this complex. And then you can either get iron desorption, uh, let's say it's just kind of KFE, you know, the rate constant uh, to desorb iron two into solution. And that's what on these different iron oxides, that step is competing against iron two sticking to the surface and being oxidized by dissolved O2 to make uh, reactive oxygen species. And this is really the difference between gertite and ferrihydrite. In this case, for example, this would be the uh, gertite case where iron two sticks to the surface. 
it's very rare. And when iron two is on the surface of the iron oxyhydroxide, its oxidation rate to iron three is much more rapid than if iron two is in solution, being homogeneously oxidized. So it's a surface catalyzed reaction of iron two being rapidly converted to iron three. In doing so, it's reducing the O2 to the uh, superoxide material. And you could see that here. This is just basically looking at the heterogeneous uh, oxidation. So this is iron two with um, molecular O2. And this is the homogeneous reaction. The iron two um, is relatively high. This is at a pH of around 5.5. Uh, this is iron two being, the, the decrease is iron two being converted into iron three. But notice the important point here is this iron two is more rapidly converted uh, to iron three when there's gertite in solution. So what happens here is iron two absorbs onto the gertite and it's rapidly oxidized by dissolved O2 to iron three. And you see a decrease in the iron two. You see this happen on ferry hydrite, but to, but to a lesser extent, than the gertite. And under the conditions we're using here, the homogeneous reaction is quite slow. As, as the pH goes down, the kinetics of iron two to iron three, oxidation by dissolved O2, uh, decreases quite rapidly. And this is just looking at the rate constant. So, so the gertite case, uh, the much higher rate constant for uh, the catalyzed oxidation of iron two to iron three. Again, why that's important is, that electron is going to uh, reduce uh, dissolved O2 to the uh, superoxide material. And that's kind of shown here where we, we get this, we get a very rapid heterogeneous oxidation on the gertite to form this uh, superoxide. Uh, in the ferry hydrate case, we just see the iron two, it pops off into surface, uh, off the surface into solution where its oxidation to iron three is, is rather slow. Uh, with dissolved O2. That's really the difference between these two surfaces. This is kind of a, a kind of a complicated plot, really just you know keying in on this part where the difference between these iron oxyhydroxides is is really just due to this um, desorption step, right? So this this would be the uh, gertite case where you form arson arsenate on the surface in the presence of light. You have this iron two, and then on gertite this iron two um, basically gets very rapidly oxidized to iron three in the presence of in, in the presence of dissolved O2. On the, and that goes on to form reactive oxygen species and, the, and then can oxidize arsenite in solution to arsenate. And that's really why the oxidation rates of arsenite to arsenate are much higher on the gertite surface. On the, um, on the uh, ferry hydrate surface, uh, what we get is uh, this iron two pops into solution uh, where it really doesn't drive uh, much oxidation chemistry. Um, you know, its oxidation rate with O2, dissolved O2 is very slow. And we get arsenate, but it basically just covers the surface. And um, that's, you know, and its oxidation rate is, is much, uh, much lower in that case, right? Because the oxidation here, this is just showing that this, K2 oxo is much is much lower uh, when O2 is in solution. When the iron two is on the surface, is very rapid. Okay, so that's kind of shown here, right? For very hydrite, arsenic surface product, the desorption of iron two is is much faster than the oxidation of that iron two on the surface. Uh, not much chemistry uh, or not much uh, oxidation of arsenite in solution. In the gertite case. The iron two stays on the surface. It gets rapidly oxidized to iron three and can drive uh, solution phase uh, chemistry. Okay. Um, just for, yeah, let me just, I'll, I'll go over this rather quickly just for the sake of time. But so the iron oxide, so there are subtle differences. Again, the chemistry changes, right? So on ferry hydrite, on that small nano, dimension material, most of the oxidation of arsenite occurs due to the oxidation on oxidative holes in the valence band. Okay. And in gertite, a lot of the arsenite oxidation occurs in solution due to the reaction of reactive oxygen species. 
what I want to do is kind of switch gears just slightly. I'm just going to give you a, another case of a metal oxide doing some interesting uh, photochemistry. But, you know, the complexity is actually more significant here because on manganese oxides, um, the ones we look at, they contain manganese 4, which is really a pretty good oxidizing agent by itself. So when manganese 4 interacts with arsenite, you can get an oxidation of arsenite to arsenate. This is in the dark. This is no light at all. And what, what can happen is this, this manganese dioxide, we look largely at burnicite, which is nominally MnO2, but it's a layered material. And when it interacts with arsenic-3, you form arsenic-5. And this is, again, in the dark. You don't necessarily need light. Um, you can enhance this rate by shining light on it. And again, we think this is due to uh, oxidative hole chemistry. This is kind of just showing different phases of burnicite. Um, you know, it's octahedrally coordinated manganese. You form these uh, uh, sheet structures. They're two-dimensional sheets that basically stack on top of each other. Um, but um, again, the, uh, the uh, structure of these manganese oxides can get quite, uh, quite complex. Again, this is just showing it's a small band gap semiconductor, these manganese oxides, a small a band gap typically thought to be slightly lower than the iron oxys, oxyhydroxides. Now, there have, been, there have been experiments where you can see, you know, in, in the iron oxide case, I showed when we irradiate that material, you can get the reduction of iron, iron three to iron two. In a similar way, in a sense, you can do the same thing on burnicite where you can get, um, you know, if you shine light, these are uh, shine light on a burnicite uh, material, we have manganese four plus, uh, this can be reduced to uh, manganese three. Um, and again, this would be only stable in the presence of a uh, oxidative hole, but a scavenger, but, but you can see this transient uh, reduction of manganese four to manganese three, similar to what you see in the iron oxides where you get a reduction of iron three to iron two. So just to kind of show that these two materials, you know, kind of analogous in, the, in that sense. Now, if you, this is the ar oxidation of arsenite by sodium burnicite. Now, the, the darkened symbols are the dark reaction, so no light. So this is arsenate concentration in solution, right? So we're oxidizing arsenite and then looking at arsenate uh, in solution. Uh, these are dark reactions. You see, even in the dark, uh, you see chemistry, uh, whether there's O2 around or no O2 around, right? So, so this is due to arsenite, arsenic 3 plus, interacting with uh, manganese 4 plus on the surface uh, to get uh, actually the reduction of manganese 4 to manganese 3. That manganese 3 can be reduced to manganese 2. In doing so, you can form arsenate from arsenite. That manganese two that you form is actually uh, soluble. You can see that come out into solution uh, through the interaction with the arsenate. And you can do this, you know, this is arsenate concentration versus time. Uh, this is in the dark. And then what we do is just shine light on it. So these are kind of these, these uh, arrows are, are kind of showing where we see light, uh, light impinging on the surface. And you see a slight increase in the rate of arsenate formation uh, when you shine light on these surfaces. And we, we again think that this is, you know, there's a big background reaction here, right? Because the dark reaction is very rapid. Um, in the iron oxides, there was no dark reaction between arsenite and the iron oxides. Here there is, because you have that manganese four being reduced to ultimately the manganese two. Uh, and if you shine light, you can see an increase in the oxidation rate. This is just showing, you know, again, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Uh, that's not critical. Um, and you can see manganese two plus come off the su surface, just like in the iron oxide case, you see iron two plus come off the surface. Here you see uh, manganese two uh, come off the surface in both these cases. So the, the you know, the, the overall chemistry uh, in the presence of light or in the dark is this reduction of manganese four to manganese two. Manganese two is soluble at low pH. If you do this at higher pH, actually that manganese two stays bound to the surface. But, he, but here we do it at low enough pH where the manganese two comes off into, uh, into the surface. And 
what we what we think is happening here again uh, again just for the sake of time the um the arson we think that the largely this um arsenite is being oxidized at oxidative holes in the burnicite uh to arsenate um and what we do there is we can use a whole scavenger here that we use mannitol here so we add this to solution which is a whole so it competes with arsenite for oxidative holes so we're 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 proposing that arsenate gets oxidized to arsenate arsenite gets oxidized to arsenate in the presence of light um, and what we do here is add a whole scavenger so this competes with the arsenite and if you add this at moderate concentrations, you can see a pretty significant reduction in the amount of arsenate produced. So again, I'm giving you a pretty simple story here, but the, um, what, it, what it's suggesting to us is that the, it's the oxidative holes that oxidize arsenic-3 to arsenic-5, similar to what happens on ferrihydrite, where you get this oxidative re, uh, chemistry occurring. Okay, and, and here we tested for um, hydroxyl radicals going to the solution. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't see any uh, reactive oxygen species in solution uh, join, this, uh, join this chemistry. Okay, so what, what I wanna do, so what, I, what I've tried to show you is iron oxides. Uh, we looked at the photochemistry of iron oxides for arsenite, uh, arsenite um, oxidation. Subtle changes on the iron oxyhydroxides can switch the mechanism, right? In one case, we see oxidation of arsenite to arsenate on the surface of ferrihydrite, but on gertite, we see most of the chemistry happen in solution, arsenite going to arsenate. And again, this is due to the, or what we think it's due to, is the difference in desorption kinetics of the iron two reduction product. Um, in the manganese oxides, uh, we see a chemistry that's somewhat similar to the um, to, to the ferrihydrite in the sense that we think most of it of the arsenite chemistry is due to um, oxidation by oxidative holes. We don't think much of the chemistry occurs uh, by reactive oxygen species in solution, which would have been analogous to the gertite case. Okay, here this is kind of what I want to show you really, you know, kind of briefly is kind of the second take home message. And in the first take home message was that the small band gap semiconductors can absorb a photon and do some interesting redox chemistry. In this experiment, we turn off the light. So there's no light here, but what we do is we, we the surface is going to act as a facilitator of redox chemistry. So what we're gonna do is take arsenite and chromate and if you put those just in homogeneous solution, nothing happens. There's a inhibition of, of this chemistry to occur. So for example, arsenite doesn't spontaneously turn into arsenate and chromate doesn't spontaneously turn into chromium three if you do this in solution. What I'm gonna show you, if you do it on a surface, a small band gap semiconductor, it goes like a, it goes like a shot. Electrons uh, flow very readily from arsenite to uh, chromate. Okay, so again, this is in the in the dark, and what you know the key reaction you know essentially what I'm going to try to propose is that arsenite here. So this is the conduction band and valence band of our semiconductor, no light, but what we think is this conduction band actually occur. The empty states in this conduction band essentially uh, act as a wire connecting the arsenite to chromate and as electron flow from the arsenite to the chromate, allowing this to reaction to occur, it doesn't occur in solution. So this is kind of a you know a little bit of a different paradigm where you can basically um, um, couple the two, um, couple the uh, donor and the acceptor through the surface. Okay, and, and again, this is, uh, there are actually a lot of sites that contain, you know, why we got into this, there are a lot of sites that contain both chromate and arsenite, but uh, not, not that critical. Um, so this is just showing what happens in the uh, in homogeneous solution. So just add chromate, you know, what we've done is, is in our lab, you just add chromate 
and arsenite in solution. And this is what, you know, this is the chromate concentration. Black is zero. So this is in the dark. This is the concentration of chromate in solution. And then we, uh, you can add arsenite, wait 12 hours, and you see about the same amount of chromate. Nothing happens. And the same thing with the arsenite. So there's no redox chemistry if you do this in homogeneous solution. Okay, and, and you know, people have looked at this chem or proposed mechanisms. This gets pretty complicated. The um, amount of, you know, you can get disproportionation of chromate, comproportionation reactions. Ultimately, you've got to take this chromate reacted with arsenite and somehow get down to uh, chromium-3 and arsenic-5. And, and clearly, a lot of these steps are kinetically hindered uh, in solution. But you know, the, our question was, can by co-localizing the adsorbate on a surface, can you basically couple these two uh, potentials together of chromate um, and uh, redu reduction potentials of chromate and, and uh, arsenite? And again, we do this with infrared spectroscopy uh, to, to study this reaction. Okay, we can study. Okay, so this is what you see. So again, we do an att attenuated total reflection uh, experiment where we flow both chromate and uh, arsenite across the surface, and you see a rapid uh, decrease of chromium, and then a rapid increase of arsenate. This is flowing it across a ferry hydride surface. So you can see this uh, isovestic uh, point here where you actually see the conversion of chromium-6 to arsenic-3, uh, arsenic-5. You don't see any of this chem chemistry happen if you don't do it on a ferry hydride surface, right? So somehow this surface is facilitating electron transfer between the chromate and arsenate. And again, I'm just gonna skip that. That's just looking at this as a function of pH, not that critical. Again, this just shows this, this reaction occurs much better at low pH than high pH. At high pH, the ferry hydride surface is negatively charged. It does not absorb chromate very well. So you see less of this reaction occur. This is due to, again, to the negatively charged surface uh, repelling chromate from solution. At low pH, it's positively charged. Chromate absorbs very readily, and you can basically drive the reaction with arsenite. So there's a lot of pH dependence in here that I'm not gonna talk about. You can show this with Zanes. I, I showed you with infrared that chromate gets reduced to chromium three. Um, here, I just, you know, we've done these experiments at the synchrotron where we can actually see um, when, we, when we add these two together, uh, we, we basically see all chromium three. So we start, this is just chromium six on ferry hydride again. This is the absorbance of the X-ray versus the photon energy. Um, this is a signature for chromium six. And we see when we add arsenite in there, these, these two are with arsenite. You see the loss of this chromium six peak and you see the gain of this chromium three peak. So you can see this happen no matter how you look at it. The important point is of course, that the uh, ferry hydrate surface is acting to make this happen. You can see the same thing with the uh, arsenite. Uh, you can do XPS, this is kind of more of the same, but you can do this with XPS and uh, also show that uh, chromium-6 goes to chromium-3 and arsenite goes to arsenate. Okay, so what I want to kind of kind of show you is conclusions from the experimental and then kind of we're actually still working on this, you know, why this all happens. There's a lot of possibilities here. Um, the the important point is, because I'm not gonna go over all these minor details just for sake of time, but the exposure of chromate and arsenite results in chromium-3 and arsen arsenate. This is the key point, right? So if you, if you add chromate and arsenite in solution, nothing happens. You add ferry hydrite, which is FH, uh, you see a rapid conversion of chromium-6 to chromium-3 and arsenic-3 to arsenic-5. And we've done a lot of computational uh, chemistry on this. Um, again, we've basically taken model surfaces of ferry hydrite. We put chromate on one side, we put arsenate on the other side, and then we've taken chromate and arsenite and put them close together and looked at kind of, you know, how, to, how does one adsorbate perturb the other, right? Because somehow when we put both these adsorbates on the surface, 
they're facilitating electron transfer from the donor to the acceptor. Okay, and there are two possible reasons for this. You know, one is that the surface just basically, you know, the chromate and arsenide come together and they form a, a you know, a, a complex that kind of um, symmetry allowed and you can basically get very rapid transfer from arsenite to chromate. The other possibility is that there is rapid electron transfer. Uh, so even if the chromate is not necessarily binding close to the arsenite, the surface provides a wire such that you can basically drive electrons from the donor to the acceptor. Actually, to make a long story short, we think a little both is, is happening because and I'll show you why. Um, what we can do to check out this guy is, of course, we can, we can use our small band gap semiconductor, which is our ferry hydrite. Um, and actually, if you, you can actually approximate the position of the conduction band of ferry hydrite, it matches up really pretty nicely with the chromate and arsenite. But you can also go to an insulator. Right? So if we use aluminum oxide, theoretically, this shouldn't happen, right? Because the conduction band is way up here relative to the donor level. So here, it's not energetically favorable for electrons to go into the conduction band and then to the acceptor, right? So an insulator surface, this um, direct electron transfer should be uh, suppressed. And you can do it on aluminum oxide to make a long story short, you see oxidation of arsenite to arsenate and chromate to chromium-3, but you see much less happen on the uh, aluminum oxide surface than you do on the small band gap uh, semiconductor. So the aluminum hydroxide, we use gypsite, has a band gap of greater than 3V, and the conduction band is not readily available for conduction. And what we see is there's a decrease in the percentage of chromium-6 reduced to uh, chromium-3. So it happens, but not to the same extent. So we, we, we're we trying to understand this. We, you know, there seems to be this um, mechanism by which electrons can be transferred through the conduction band between donor and acceptor. But we also think um, in, in certain situations, you can get complex formation, which allows very rapid transfer. Obviously, this, the structure of that complex is much different than what you could form uh, in solution. Um, so what we did was, you know, I just kind of show you just kind of some modeling experiments where we take uh, chromate and arsenite, we put these on a surface, and I'm just going to show you the, the key result here. And the key result is as follows. What we find is, so if we do a atomic charge analysis, so just basically looking at the charge on the atoms. So this is looking at the charge of the arsenic and charge of chromium. These are computations. Uh, and if we just look at the solution phase species, we get some net, net charge of 1.55 on the arsenic atom and chromium 1.09. If we start putting these on the surface, you see an increase in the charge. There's actually charge withdrawal from the, um, from the uh, chromium atom. And what, what you see is opposite and adjacent. So just by absorbing the chromate on the iron oxyhydroxide surface, you change its reduction potential. This is a kind of a, another take home message where the surface can tune the, uh, the potential, reduction potential of the adsorbate. Here we're seeing it through computation. We think that by adsorbing the chromate on the ferry hydrite, you just make it even a better oxidizing agent. Uh, we don't see much happen with the arsenic, actually. Uh, the chromate seems to be the one that re the reduction potential is basically the surface is a ligand hanging on to the chromate. It's changing its um, reduction potential. And, you know, why does chromium lose electron density upon absorption? You can, you can actually, you know, what we started to do is some electrochemistry, and this, this is kind of closes this section, but if you put if you look at the reduction potential of chromate to, to chromium-3 on three different surfaces, aluminum oxide, ferrihydrite, and titania, you see a change in the reduction potential 
of the chromate. So this is clearly, you know, you're changing the electronic structure of the chromate when you bind it to these metal oxide surfaces. You change its ability uh, as an oxidizing agent, essentially, um, by, by, by sticking it on different surfaces. So this is kind of a, you know, something which I think is a key um, concept that needs to be understood. So this is something that actually we've left it for a little bit. We're trying to get back to it, to really understand this phenomenon because we think this has a lot to do with it. So there are two mechanisms that we think is happening. One is electron transfer through the conduction band, but convoluted or layered on top of that is that we've changed the reduction potential of the chromate from what it was in solution to something different when it's on a surface. Okay, so we think that's, that has a lot to do with it. If it actually, if you analyze these, uh, it's a much better oxidizing agent on titania than it is uh, on aluminum oxide. Okay, so we still need to look at this, but uh, again, we, we see this is um, needed to see if this redistribution of charge um, is also observed. Okay, and this is something we're working on, trying to un understand. So, the, so in summary, you know, so we've got really, in a sense, three take-home messages. The, these first two are really due to the arsenite oxidation to arsenate. Um, again, this is due to the oxidation of arsenite on the oxidizing holes uh, of the photoexcited semiconductor. And you can also use these small band gap semiconductors as basically an electron conduit for electrons to flow from a donor to an acceptor. And then finally, you can change the reduction potential of the chromate uh, or an adsorbate uh, by adsorbing on the surface. That's something we need to look at a little more carefully. We think it's an important principle. Uh, that needs to be understood. Okay, and that, that's um, pretty much what I have to give to you. I'd be happy to answer any questions if, if there might be some. Thank you, Professor uh, Daniel Strong, for this wonderful talk. So next we can go for a panel discussions. Professor uh, Palnivelu, please raise your questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadish, uh, for the opportunity. It was a wonderful talk very difficult to explain the conventional electrochemical potential easy to explain but especially with the light and similarly the uh, microorganism uh, wait uh parliament sir please wait uh, yeah please pr pr professor daniel can you uh, stop sharing your slides so that uh, we can oh, have yeah, a good yeah. discussion yeah thank you sorry about that <laughs> it's okay thank you thank you thank you okay. gotta get used to zoom technology yeah okay uh, it was a wonderful talk, Rosette. Congratulations. Great, thanks. It's, it's, it's a really difficult to explain the potential reduction, oxidation, etc., in presence of light as well as microorganism. Conventional electrochemical potential based EC. But you explained the semiconductor photocalysis reduction of the two important toxic species, arsenic and chromium, very nicely. Yeah, we, th we think that's, you know, it's these small band gap semiconductors do a lot of, yes. you know, the, the thing, actually the, you know, obviously it's been well known oxidative holes on semiconductors and, and what I think is sort of new is this potentially a new paradigm where it's okay. basically acting as a, you know, electrical connection between the donor and the acceptor. So it's allow you know by putting these donor and acceptor on the surface, um, you can actually see charge flow from the donor to the acceptor, uh, which is kind of an interesting principle. We we're trying to correlate that, um, you know, we're trying to calculate the energy levels of these different small band gap semiconductors and see how they match with the reduction potential of the chromate and the uh, reduction potential of the arsenite, right? Because there should be good overlap to get good electron flow. Yes, especially on the heterogeneous medium. Homogeneous medium, it was yeah. not taking place. So heterogeneous, yeah. as you mentioned, it is uh, happening only in heterogeneous medium. For example. Yeah, you know, actually the conduction band of the semiconductor, that, that you want to kind of, you know, higher should be the donor and then lower than the conduction band should be the acceptor, right? So the, the conduction band's got to be kind of be straddled by the reduction potential of the chromate and the arsenite. 
uh, aluminum oxide that doesn't happen and these other ones it does you know these two elements are really a problem in india uh, one state west bengal and india is contaminated uh, groundwater is contaminated with the arsenic other part of india we have a lot of tanneries and electroplating industry where chromium is chrome plating is one of the things we have a lot of uh, issues here in india i hope yeah you know saying. not only in india but uh, here in the in the states yeah. Um, I think I think I think everybody's got the same problem. <laughs> yes, yes. Both are toxic, and the mobility yeah. varies with the oxidation state, and that is important. Yeah. yeah. And I have a few uh, clarification from you. One of the technology employed for arsenic remediation is with nano ion oxide. Okay. It is uh, the nano ion oxide. Arsenic is removed. That is a technology. These option right now they are going for acid. mostly for deserving the absorbed organic for reuse purpose is it possible to use light as a desorbing medium your experimental studies mm -hmm. indicate there is a redox a reaction is taking place ion is coming out and well, if you go for acid based one most of the ion may be leached out ion leaching may be more but if you go for light based one exposing to uv light or visible light whatever it is only that particular component what is absorbed or reacted alone may be leached out during washing it can be you know another another situation on the iron oxides i think there's very rapid uh dissolution reprecipitation reactions okay. that can basically you know capture you know more you know we've never looked into that because if we look at the morphology of these particles before and after they do change is there's clearly dissolution reprecipitation and we think you know there's almost an increase in surface area in a sense that can capture even more uh arsenic in our case but you know you need the you know we we don't see any well in our experiments how we do them we don't see any change in the oxidation state of the arsenic unless we're shining light on it most of your reaction you carried out at pH 5.5 you mentioned yeah 5.5 arsenic yeah. Uh, did you take care of the pK values of arsenic three and arsenic five? Any experiment conducted a different uh, pH value to represent the pK value of arsenic three and arsenic five? Yeah, well, the pKa oxides? value of arsenite is up mm -hmm. near nine or ten, so it's okay. very very high. So the the conditions we do it at, the arsenite's completely protonated, right? It's it's not charged, and and that's one of the issues, right? Because There's not a strong attraction between the arsenite and ferrihydrite at pH 5.5. Okay. It needs to be a deprotonation step, which seems to occur, such that it can stick. Right, but if we do it at very, if we do it at much higher pH, okay, uh, you can see well things get a confusing for other reasons. But you'll see much more uh, arsenite absorption if we go to very high pH, right? Because then you deprotonate the arsenite. you can get some more absorption on the ferry hydride but my final my final question to you is have you conducted any experiment based on methyl arsenic monomethyl arsenic dimethyl arsenic any studies for this mm, uh, we 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 haven't not okay, yeah. okay okay yeah unfortunately that's yeah. all from my side thank you very much yeah. wonderful talk thank talk. you thanks dr chaindas please Thank you, uh, Professor Daniel, for your very nice and informative talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have one question in that uh, arsenic chromium system oxidation of arsenic and reduction of chromate. Okay. So uh, it is facilitated in uh, uh, ferrite surface, right? Yep. Yes. So will there be competition of? Uh, uh, I mean. Chromium six uh, is reduced to chromium three, but is there any chance of reduction of iron three to iron two? That's an interesting. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, would say yes. That's an interesting question to, to look at computational. So if you take yeah, that's. So what we think is happening when we put chromate and arsenide on the surface. A lot of people have looked at this. Is there's an electron hopping reaction between the electron can kind of hop from lattice sites in the iron oxide? Um, 
you know, in computation there, people okay. describe that as a transient reduction of iron three to iron two. Okay. So if you have a driving force for the electron to go through, there's a, you know, an iron three plus iron two plus kind of resonance percolating through the surface. Um, and then the electron, you know, where the electron goes in and then it comes out. But okay. if it's you- a It's a reversible change, iron three to iron two. We, yeah, in that sense it is. But if you just take arsenite mm -hmm. and just stick it to iron oxide, you mm -hmm. do not see a re reduction of iron three to iron two. Okay. So what I'm saying is if you're, if you're getting a, you know, by, ha but now is it, you know, when you have chromate and arsenite, it's a different story. You're, you're pulling the electron through the conduction band, right? Cause there's a okay. potential difference now. Yeah. And to describe that, people talk about, you know, transient iron three, iron two, iron three, iron, you know, and as it goes through the surface. But it's not a, not something you can spectroscopically, well, you probably could with very fast spectroscopic tools, uh, look at okay. that reduction. But, but to answer your question, we, we don't see, in our experiment, we don't see iron three reduction to iron two. It's, it all stays iron three. And uh, I think uh, you have measured the increasing concentration of chromium-3 by FTIR, ATR, FTIR? Chromium-3, yeah. So chromium-3, we generally do. Um, I have to admit that's probably our least characterized material, oh. except that we know it's chromium-3. I think you can um, go with UV visible spectra because the chromate is yellow in color and chromium-3 is uh, light blue in color. So yeah, with we, the help of UV visible, you can measure the increasing concentration or conversion of chromium six to chromium three with the UV visible. Spectrum. Yeah, we've never had great luck with the with the in a colloidal suspension. Um, getting that, you, you bring up a good point, and um, we we don't have good quantification by UV vis. Um, what we generally do is to use um, X-ray absorption or X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy to determine how much chromium-3 we have, um, and it's on the surface. But um, we typically, you know, on, the, on these materials, it, you know, everything absorbs to the surface. And uh, we haven't had much luck with, uh, you know, using UV vis, for example. And uh, but, one more question, final question. Sure. Uh, for this uh, electron transfer, you proposed uh, two mechanisms, two routes. One is direct charge transfer, and another one is through conduction band, right? So yes. just my uh, curiosity, uh, in case of alumina, uh, uh, I think uh, L2O3 surface, there is only a charge transfer. Some sort of conversion is there. And for ferrite, uh, both, uh, both mechanisms are there. Yeah, we think we think so. You know, the kinetics of this reaction are much faster uh -huh. if you do it on very hydrate. Is, uh, and if this is so, both are operating. Then what is the uh, weightage of relative weightage of these two paths, or it cannot be determined? Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because I, I guess that point came across. Yeah, so that's great. Um, yeah, I think I think there are two two mechanisms. We're trying to distinguish yeah. them by experiment and computation. Okay. We think one is due to just the concentration effect. Now you, on the surface, you've got chromate and arsenate perhaps interacting directly with each other, held in some kind of complex that allows electron transfer to occur. And then in the other case, and we know the other case is there because we can go to very low concentrations of chromate and arsenite. So we're kind of pretty sure they're not attached to each other and you still see the chemistry happen. So we think they can be spatially delocalized or they can be spatially localized, two different mechanisms. And we think both of them are viable on the surface. Yeah. And on the aluminum oxide, we shut off one of them. Uh -huh. We only allow direct uh, contact to occur. Now it gets complicated because I didn't, I didn't go into the details because, um, but Chromate really binds pretty tightly to the surface. So arsenite is, it's coming in from the solution side and it's being spontaneously oxidized arsenate. We're not sure whether that really absorbs that strongly, you know, but it's that 
you know, it's kind of contacts the chromate on the surface, and then there's a spontaneous uh, charge transfer. It gets it gets a little complicated, but but yes, you're right. Two mechanisms, um, only one is occurring on aluminum oxide, but it still happens. Yeah. And one more point, uh, you have shown one very interesting point that uh, redox potential of chromate system is changing with uh, changing surface, titania, alumina, ferrite. So is it a generalized fact? It is true for all other systems also? Their well, it's a, general, it's a generalized fact in homogeneous, uh, homogeneous so they, in organic they, they, chemistry. They, they where you can... Different, in case of heterogeneous system, so that depends on the surface chemistry. They may change. It, it depends on the surface chemistry. So depends, you know, depends on the binding and the charge flow from the metal atom and the adsorbate oh, yeah. to the surface. Right. So the surface could be pushing electron density onto the adsorbate or it could be taking it away from that metal atom, just like, you know, attaching different ligands in homogeneous yeah. solution to metal is yeah. the same concept. A little yeah, more complicated, yeah. however, the calculation on the surface. But we think it's very similar. And if we look at the, you know, if we do just a little bit of electrochemistry and look at the reduction potential of chromium six to chromium three, it changes depending on whether the aluminum oxide or yeah. whether the chromate is on titania, aluminum oxide, or ferrihydrite. So it's definitely changing. And people have known this. You can look in the literature, and mm -hmm. they don't use it to explain phenomenon like this. But you look at different papers and chromate reduction, and it varies depending on what surface you have it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it makes a little, you know, makes a lot of chemical sense, too. It's just that in our case, we, we think it's... Um, you know, it, it could be one of the drivers mm -hmm. of electron transfer because you change the oxidation potential, the driving force for electron uh, yeah. transfer. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. Professor. Sure, and I, 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 I'm glad everybody stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, it's, it's late. Thank it's you. late near you, right? Uh, it's not late, sorry. Okay, right. uh, Professor Daniel, I have one question. Sure. So, uh, in uh, ion oxides, that means in ferrihydrite or, or uh, goethite, after this option of uh, arsenate 5 plus, that means arsenic 5 plus, there are some papers it is reported that uh, this arsenate is again reduced to arsenite 3 plus. Mm. Did you observe such type of uh, uh, conversion, at least in the absence of light? In the absence of light, um... In the absence of light, well, can I answer your direction, uh, your question um, that well? I don't know. Uh, what I can do is give you two experimental observations. One, one is if on the ferrihydrate surface, we can see the complete removal of arsenite from solution and it ending up as arsenate on the surface. So in that case, we can see complete removal if we tune it. Uh, if we put in excess arsenide in that case, we still see arsenide in solution, but I couldn't tell you whether some of it came from arsenate reduction. So I don't know in that case. However, you know, arsenate's really tightly bound to these iron oxides of ferrihydrate and it doesn't come back off. The, um, in the Gertite case, yeah, I don't think I can answer. That's a really good question. I, I don't think I can answer it. The, um, all I can say in the Gertite, where a lot of the oxidation of arsenite to arsenate occurs in solution, um, I'm not sure I would ever know whether some of that arsenate could be converted back to arsenite. The thermodynamics I don't see happening, but um, I, I can't, yeah, I, I don't have an experimental observation to really directly address that question. All right, okay. So uh, one more question. Uh, among the all the oxides or oxyhydroxides of iron, magnetite is the most stable form of iron oxides. Wh which one? Magnetite, Fe3O4. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So uh, why didn't you test magnetite as a photocatalyst or for this reaction? Well, magnetite's an interesting one, at least for oxide. Mm -hmm. Oh, which, which, what's the stoichiometry of that? That is oxides of iron, Fe3O4. Oh, you're talking about Fe3O4. So Fe3O4, yeah. that's got, um, 
we've never looked at that. You know, that's obviously a mixed iron, three iron, two. Um, be an interesting one to look at. I, I don't, yeah, we, we, we haven't looked at it. Um, you know, hematite would be interesting. Right. Too. Um, yeah, the, 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 um, the magnetite one. Yeah, we have we haven't looked at it. That would be interesting to look at for sure. Okay, we we you. we generally, you know, a lot of this work came out of um it was a a grant to look at iron oxyhydroxides. And right. so we we never really did too many metal oxides like right. magnetite, hematite. Um but it would be worthwhile to take a look at some of those, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sure. uh, uh, yeah. this question. So we can uh, wind up the program. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude for to Professor Daniel for this excellent, interesting topic, exclusively these an uh, rose chemistry of uh, chromate and uh, arsenate over iron and manganese oxides. You covered most of the things, including the basic reactions of photochemistry, the redox reactions, everything. It is interesting. I think my students, all the viewers, are watching this program. They may be inspired by your talk. I think they may raise some of the questions. I will share the questions by email. You can answer it. And that yeah, of course. Me. I mean, uh, espe especially if there's some collaborative uh, with anybody, you know, right, some collaborations right. we could strike up. That would be great. You know, right, experimental right. collaborations. Yeah. Right. Right. So even in that case, you can have a collaboration with these two experts because uh, you know. Uh, Dr. Parnival is a wide, versatile man, I can say, because I know him personally, li like you. Uh, he, he is having the experience in chemistry, environmental chemistry, environmental engineering, environmental science, a lot of area. He's a wide expert man. So even- My PhD, my PhD <laughs> was on arsenic. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, we should, we, should, we, should, we, should, we should talk by email and see if there's some uh, sure, sure, areas of common that. interest. Yes, yes. Yeah, be I, fun. I did it uh, 30 years before. 30 years before. Arsenic speciation was my oh, right. oh, okay. Well, get back into it. <laughs> yes, yes, sure. Certainly. Thank you. Well, that's a great thing about technology these days, right? Because you can, you can collaborate with anyone around the globe, you know, in a in a pretty, you know, pretty straightforward way. So um, that'd be great if we if there are some common areas of interest that we could we All could right. uh, work together right. with. Right, right. Even uh, we have Chayanda and uh, Polanyi, both are good experts in this area, in, especially in the basis of chemistry, all these redox reactions. That's why I invited them. Even you know, this uh, uh, discussion is totally vibrant. It was a nice discussion. I thank Dr. Palani, uh, Professor Palanivelu and uh, Chayanda for this vibrant discussions. I thank all the viewers for watching us on this, this program. And for the viewers, tomorrow we will uh, Meet at 3 p.m. Uh, by Professor Muttupandi Nasho Kumar will join with us at 3 p.m. tomorrow. He will discuss on acoustic cavitation, that means ultrasonic applications in water and wastewater. So till then, bye. Great. Bye.